Hi and welcome to the orchestration section. A question that often gets asked is the difference between orchestration and arranging. Uh, they're two quite different things. Arranging is generally manipulating the structure, melody, harmony, etc. For example, if you wanted to use the same core piece of music for a different scene, different emotions, different moods, that would be arranging. You'd be taking elements of the melody and harmony, tweaking them slightly to give them a different sound, a different tempo, structure, things like that. Orchestration more focuses on the instrumentation. Traditionally, orchestration is literally putting onto orchestral instruments. The term I, I find tends to apply to all aspects now, whether it's synthetic or orchestral or whatever else. So when I talk about orchestration, I'm talking about expanding our arrangement onto the actual instruments, adding little things here or there to give it a bit more oomph, um, extra patterns, extra bits and pieces, flourishes. Uh, I mean, if you listen to a, a, any John Williams music, um, the orchestration on that's um, amazing with all, all kinds of things happening all over the place in the orchestra. At this stage, you really need to start thinking about the limitations of the instrumentation. Sample libraries don't often have those limitations, so you can go as low as you want on a violin or as high as you want on a violin. In real life, a violin has a specific range that it has to work within, and if you don't adhere to those rules, it's going to sound fake straight away. The amount of times I've heard woodwind instruments that have no space for anyone to breathe and it's it's instantly it does, doesn't sound right and everybody whether people listen to orchestral music a lot or not there's something programmed into people that realize that there's not there's that doesn't sound right and it's because there's no space for that wind player to actually breathe so think about that the range stamina of the player um, how they play, you know, writing piano parts, think about how wide people can actually span their hands. People, you know, can play an octave, a ninth, maybe a tenth. I think Rachmaninoff used to be able to play elevenths, maybe more. I can't, I'm, I'm not sure of the exact thing. But anyway, think about that. You know, don't write parts that are impossible to play because it will make your pieces sound unreal. Unless, of course, you're working with synthetic music or electronic music, in which case you have a bit more flexibility with that. But if you're trying to make it sound authentic, uh, think about the limitations of the instruments. What's also really important for me to point out at this stage is you don't have to keep the piano in your composition. Just because we did our sketching with piano, that whole stuff, that whole uh, piano part can be taken out and put onto different instruments. If you keep the piano in, all of your pieces are going to have piano and that's no good. That said, I am keeping the piano in this one because that's, that was part of the concept. And as we said, piano in its, in its mid and high range can be a really, really romantic sound. In terms of the samples that I would use in my orchestration stage, I'd normally put them onto um, a mid-range sample library, a slightly better one. So if you have um, a better sample library, such as a contact sample library, either complete or even east-west, anything like that, open just a, a, a simpler version of the samples. The idea is that we want to get a, a good feeling for how it sounds and we want to actually start hearing it ourselves to make it sound good. But you also don't want to overload your computer at this point because it gets, if when you're orchestrating it starts freezing and jamming and, and, uh, and crashing, it's just going to drive you crazy. So here's our orchestration. As you can see, it's developed out um, quite a bit more than it was at the end of our sketch sketching side of things. So I'll just take you through again how I've done it. And, and what things we're looking for. So I mentioned this texture uh, pad that I was going to add at the bottom. I have that sound now. So it's just a nice little subtle sound that fits underneath. I, uh, this has been created with uh, Virtues violence pack um, extreme violin maneuvers it's a really cool sample library that's essentially all been created with violins but it has all kinds of um, stuff on there lots of it's uh, sample like pr uh, processed audio processing to create new sounds some of it's like they've they've captured burning violins or hitting violins with chopsticks and all kinds of stuff so it's uh, it's good fun. There's lots of nice little pad samples in there. I like them because they just sound a bit different to a, a synth pad that you'd open up because it has a, some acoustic kind of sound to it as well, which is really, really nice. So I've just, I just, I just loaded two presets and tweaked them a little bit to capture that, um, that pad sound. 
and that just sits throughout. There's two sounds that come in and out throughout the whole the whole piece there, uh, and actually moves a little bit more towards the end with the chord sequence. But generally, it's just a, a, a straight pad. What I would normally do. Now the way I have this set up is not ideal. I've used uh, multi-instruments, which you don't really need to do anymore. There's different ways of doing it. I wrote this piece a few years ago. But if you uh, right click on a track, you can see uh, track header components. And if you make sure you have freeze selected, you can freeze this track, which kind of is like bouncing in place. Or you, you can bounce in place as well, but freezing is, is, is sometimes a better option. Now what this does, when you go to play it, it'll quickly freeze everything. And it kind of mimics an audio track there. So the problem with MIDI is whenever you start halfway through a, a MIDI sample that's already had the trigger, it doesn't do anything. So when I'm trying to play halfway through this piece and I've got a pad that's running the whole way underneath, I'm not going to hear anything. If I start here, for example, the pad's not there. Freezing normally means that the pad is there because there's a bounce of it. As I said, the way I have this set up, unfortunately, doesn't let me do that, so I'll turn that off. But that's a real top tip. If you're working with long pad sounds and you're frustrated that you can't hear them coming in, just freeze that track and then you'll be able to hear them. It saves processing power as well. So if your projects are crashing a lot because you have too many samples open, if you freeze a few tracks, the computer doesn't have to load those samples every time. It's because they're already frozen and it's like creating a temporary cache in Logic that, that keeps those files there. So we have a pad sound there that sits underneath. Uh, with string orchestration, I've expanded this out onto uh, our, our string quartet, violin one, violin two, um, viola, and cello. Not sure why that still says strings. The orchestration I'd already planned in before that conceptualizing stage. That's the bit that I sketched out, but. So you can see uh, how this all comes together. I'll select all of these together. Oop. Too much. This is on East West Play, uh, East West Orchestra sample library. So we can see our violins up here. Cellos, viola, violin two, violins up here, cello, things to remember when you're writing for strings. And this seems so obvious, but I'm amazed at how long it took me to realize it and also how people don't realize it, but they don't all have to move together. They don't have to start together. When you have a string section starting, as you'll see here, I have my um, violin two and viola start here. And then the cello joins the bar later, it didn't all start together. And it just adds a bit more interest to it. let something else come in after we've already started the string section. If I'd have started this at the beginning, yes, it would sound nice. Oh, I need to extend there. Uh, oh. Yes, it would still sound nice, but it would just lose a little bit of interest. Because then nothing happens in that next bar. So strings don't always have to start together. They don't have to move together. That's really, really important. Think about where spaces are in your melody and how other instruments can take over. So you see our main melody is in this violin part at the top. And it's really, really simple. There's a pause, and then it's in octaves, just to give it a bit more fullness. But if that was all that we had, if all the strings are doing that together, that's going to be really, really boring. So instead, as we get to this long held note, you can see our viola part has a little pattern that starts. And then that's 
moves into the violin 2 part where we have this takeover. Back to the violas. So we have our main melody, which is really simple, but then in our counter melodies, we have some more interesting things going on. So when you hear it together, viola bar, second violins, back to our melody, and then our cellos, sorry, violas. So find patterns and then see how you can spread them throughout the instruments rather than just focusing on one instrument playing one part. Likewise, the melody doesn't have to stay on the violin one part. It could move into the cello for a sec for, for a part or, in, or elsewhere. There's all sorts of things you can do with your string orchestration rather than just block chords all moving together. When you are orchestrating your strings and when you have chords moving together though, just try to avoid too many jumps and uh, individual parts jumping around too much. Try to have them moving to a note closer by rearranging the chord, and that's going to help you have a bit more um, subtlety to your uh, string arrangements too. Thanks for watching, and I hope you learned something new. This video is taken from my complete course on composing romantic music. If you'd like to sign up, there's a link in the description that'll get you enrolled for just $10.99. I go through the whole process, including the planning and prep, composition, orchestration, mixing, and mastering. Also, don't forget to hit subscribe to get new tips and tricks weekly on composing and producing music for Moving Image.